Okay, colleagues, um, we're going to go into session two. Thank you for bearing with us um, through the in-camera session. We're now um, going straight into session two. Um, I'd like to welcome um, Dr. Carrera and Dr. Ragazzi, um, who will uh, present to us a study on national programs for mass surveillance of personal data in EU member states and their compatibility um, with EU law. This study has been presented to all members um, and we're going to go straight to um, Sergio Carrera. Sergio, you have the floor. Uh, actually, I will uh, start if you don't mind. Yes. yes. Okay, okay. So we're going to start with Francesco Ragazzi. Thank you very much. Thank you very much and uh, thank you very much to uh, DGI Paul and uh, Libe Secretariat uh, for the invitation. Um, so this report is the result of uh, preliminary research carried out by a team of researchers in uh, September 2013. It draws on secondary sources, on uh, investigative media sources, as well as uh, experts' interviews, um, so interviews with experts on digital and cybersecurity across Europe. Our survey focused on five EU member states, the UK, uh, France, Germany, Sweden, and the Netherlands. I will first give you an overview of EU member states' large-scale intelligence programs, and then outline uh, five main features which emerge from our research. So the sections A and B in the outline presented here in the slide. And uh, Sergio Carrera will then cover uh, the modalities of EU action and the policy recommendations that the report formulates, so sections C and D. So we distinguish in the report two types of acquisition of a mass amount of personal data. The first is communications cable tapping. This practice consists in placing interceptors on a large uh, fiber optic cables that connect the different hubs uh, of the internet. So in the UK, the Tempora program run uh, by GCHQ is reported to have placed 200 uh, interceptors on the cables that go from the British Isles uh, to Western Europe and to the US. Uh, but the French uh, external, service, external intelligence service, DGSE, has allegedly placed uh, similar interceptors, for example, on underwater cables out of uh, uh, its base in Djibouti. The German BND has said to tap directly into the largest internet hub in Europe, uh, the Frankfurt-based uh, DECIX. And Sweden's uh, agency, FRA, uh, taps the underwater cables uh, uh, that connect to the Baltic countries and Russia. Now, the second type of practice, uh, like the PRISM program uh, in the, uh, of the NSA, is the acquisition of consumer uh, personal data by requesting or forcing private companies that regularly collect vast amounts of data for commercial purposes, uh, so companies such as Google, Facebook, Apple, or Skype, to deliver such data. And we now know that uh, uh, serv uh, serv several European services are believed uh, to have obtained mass amounts uh, uh, of data uh, on their own nationals through this channel. So one more point, uh, not all agencies are uh, created equal. There is an enormous discrepancy of budget and means uh, that are at the disposal of uh, US and EU agencies. So if we uh, uh, look in terms of uh, budget, there's something that we can quickly note. First, the large advantage of the NSA in relation to uh, European agencies with a budget of over 7 billion euros a year. The second point is within Europe, the prominence of GCHQ, which has with 1.2 uh, billion euros of budget over twice the budget of other agencies such as uh, BND or uh, DGSE. Now, the same is true if we look at the sheer number of employees directly working for these agencies. Of course, there are no official numbers, but it is estimated that around uh, 37,000 employees work for the NSA directly, not the subcontractors, uh, whereas over 5,600 uh, work for GCHQ and about 4,600 for the DGSO. 
So I would like uh, now to emphasize five main aspects of the type of large-scale surveillance that emerged from this preliminary research. First, it is, it is important to emphasize that the scale of the surveillance programs that have been revealed has no precedent. In other words, this is not business as usual. It is unprecedented in terms of the amount of data that is collected and the various types, types of data that is collected. And if you want in the questions and answer, I, I can go back to the distinction between uh, data and meta, uh, metadata. So based on recent revelations, the amount of data collected by GCHQ alone uh, is in the order of 21 petabytes a day, uh, which if you want a comparison, represents the daily use of 2.1 million heavy internet consumers. So since many users only use a fraction of that bandwidth, which I calculate of approximately 10 gigabytes a day, uh, the number of individuals under surveillance at any given time is therefore considerably higher. Now, a second uh, main issue that we know very little about, and this is a key technical and both a key technical and a key legal uh, uh, question, is the way in which the data collected is used, processed, and distributed. This is what makes uh, uh, the distinction between what we could consider legitimate forms of surveillance and illegitimate forms of, of surveillance, or at least forms of surveillance that uh, may, uh, may <clears throat> ask questions. And so the, the distinction between these two is blurred uh, because we, we are unable to determine if what is going on is actually targeted surveillance, which is of course necessary for the purposes of countering terrorism, uh, or fighting uh, other types of crime, and large-scale indiscriminate surveillance based on data mining, which poses all sorts of questions in terms of human rights and basic data protection principles. So our entire categories of people considered a priori suspect and put on separate watch lists on the basis of keyword searches. How do keywords work and what happens to people who match those keywords? In other words, are we resuscitating the uh, uh, U.S. project of the total information awareness, which was rejected um, by U.S. Congress uh, already in 2003 and 2004? Third point, uh, an important remark from our preliminary study is that the question of large-scale surveillance <coughs> cannot be only framed as a U.S. versus Europe issue. Large-scale surveillance programs are run and deployed in cooperation between the U.S. and European member states' intelligence and security agencies. It is therefore transnational networks, or what we call in the report guilds of professionals, transnational guilds of professionals, that are operating. And we have uh, with networks such as the Five Eyes or uh, uh, networks uh, such as Alliance Base information about how these networks uh, might be operating. And I think here the strong connection between GCHQ and the NSA, which, uh, NSA, I'm sorry, which has been uh, um, revealed in, in different um, media outlets is particularly telling. So the main, uh, main questions here is therefore not so much uh, that of uh, US-EU diplomatic discussion about sovereignty, but how this transnational network of intelligence services should or could be monitored and kept in check by a network of oversight authorities that could also operate at a transnational uh, scale. Now, fourth, what we know about surveillance programs such as PRISM is that they're not only matters of state's security agencies, um, but they heavily involve private companies through different forms of willing or coerced partnerships. When we think of those programs, it is therefore useful to think of them as forms of hybrid surveillance in which commercial and security interests are interlinked. This is not only important for the comprehension of how surveillance works uh, through the everyday tools of regular European citizens who might want to use Gmail, Facebook, or Skype, but also because uh, while the work of intelligence services does not fall within the scope of the European Parliament's uh, concern, questions of data protection and individual freedoms, these elements certainly are in the remit of the Parliament. Now, my fifth point, uh, to summarize, it appears rather clearly that the in, uh, important question marks uh, lurk over the core principle of democratic life and free market economy. 
First, we know that an unprecedented amount of information is being collected, but we know very little about how it is being processed, for what purposes, or with whom it is uh, eventually shared. We have no assurances that broad data mining is not taking place. Intelligence agencies have often argued that these programs are justified to fight against terrorism, finding the dangerous 1% justifying uh, spying uh, on the remaining 99% uh, is the usual argument. But so far the results have been rather meager, and even the director of the NSA had to admit that the US, to the U.S. Senate that merely one or two plots uh, were foiled thanks to the NSA mass surveillance programs. I initially stated that there were 54, but now it boils down to it's only one or two. Um, so we also hear now that it's not only about counterterrorism, but that there is diplomatic and industrial spying uh, going on. So the purpose and the proportionality of this data collection are uh, uh, absolutely key questions here. Second, the problem is that these programs destabilize the fundamental, fundamental principle of trust, which is at the basis of free market democracies and good international partnerships. Trust in public institutions is certainly a key element of democratic life and is evidently in danger if everyone is considered uh, a suspect. Trust is um, uh, trust that every uh, economic actor relies on the same degree of information is also a key element of a healthy economic system. And trust between consumers and businesses is a key factor of economic growth. So large-scale surveillance programs damages trust in these uh, in three aspects. The strength of uh, democratic regimes, as the example of the Church Committee has shown in uh, 1975 in the United States, is that the bigger the crisis, the more the system of checks and balances is reinforced and should be reinforced. This is what distinguishes democracies from police states. For the ab above mentioned reasons, an analysis of Europe's surveillance programs cannot be reduced only to the question of balance between data protection versus national security or to a technical question to be resolved by experts, but has to be framed also in terms of collective freedoms and the nature of the democratic regimes. So I now give the floor to Dr. Sergio Carrera from SEPS, who will develop more on the legal aspects of the problem. Thank you. Thank you, and, and good morning to, to all. Thanks a lot for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to have the opportunity to come here and present and share with you um, the findings of our investigation. Uh, legal modalities of uh, action. Uh, of course, we are all aware of current argumentations, current justifications which have been given by uh, certain uh, member state governments and uh, law enforcement authorities saying this is national security. This is national security. The European Union should do nothing here. Well, is that so? Is that so? And um, the study actually engages with this dilemma. Uh, can we see a stronger role for the European Union here? And is, is it that the case that national security remains exclusively within the remits of governments and intelligence communities. There are three modalities of action uh, of EU law, from an EU law perspective, that we propose in the study. The first one is rethinking national security, the concept of national security from a democratic rule of law point of view. I come back to the ideas posed by my colleague. This is about democratic rule of law principles. So perhaps this could be a starting point also when understanding what is national security. If you can move to the next slide. Yeah. One of the key messages of the study is that member states' uh, programs, surveillance programs, are incompatible with democratic rule of law principles and the values upon which the Union has been founded, Article 2 of the Treaty on European Union. The notion of national security can no longer be understood from the sole perspective of intelligence communities. They do not hold, in our view, the ownership of this. National security brings us back to national constitutional traditions, the constitutions which lay at the basis of the liberal democracies uh, composing the European Union, and in those constitutions, the principle of separation of powers is central. There needs to be checks and balances. There needs to be a scrutiny and judicial and democratic accountability on what the executive and its intelligence arms are doing or not doing. This is central, we all know, 
to prevent abuse and arbitrariness. In the study, we look at the boundaries, the boundaries which uh, currently exist in the European Union and uh, the European legal system, which divide what is a legitimate and what is an illegitimate action or intervention of uh, intelligence and executive. And here, the European Court uh, of Human Rights has been very active, has been very prolific, at times of giving, uh, providing light on what are, what are those standards. There is a substantial body of jurisprudence we present in the report, uh, as simple uh, as possible, basically laying down the criteria which determine what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. What is in accordance to the law? What is necessary in a democratic society? There is a set of standards that also apply to any executive in the European Union and any intelligence service activities. And the court has been very clear, the Strasbourg Court, in this concern. Both in respect of Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, Private and Family Life, as well as Article 5, Liberty and Security in the context of extraordinary renditions. We must not forget the links with uh, the work of uh, uh, the activities of intelligence services also in that context. The EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, another legal question, Article 51, too often uh, uh, mentioned as a non-encompassing justification for doing nothing about this. Oh, the EU Charter only applies within the scope of EU law, and this is not within the scope of EU law. Well, I think also we need to rethink this a little bit more carefully. This study highlights the France and judgments of uh, the Luxembourg <coughs> Court, where the Court very clearly says, yes, the Charter only applies within the scope of EU law. However, the EU Charter and the European Convention on Human Rights are already part of a national constitutional traditions. Judges at the national level in member states are already using the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights independently of being within or outside the scope of EU law to interpret and review, uh, uh, including government activities. We had the speech in this House of Vivian Reading uh, in June 2013, and the question was posed by some of the members of this House as regards this issue of the competence, the legal competence. The Union has no legal competence on intelligence. And I think that the Commissioner gave a very appropriate answer, where she said, yes, of course, intelligence in principle remains exclusive competence. However, fundamental rights as inscribed in the EU Charter must be also respected. In the next slide, whose security are we talking about, really? Whose security are we talking about? My colleague has mentioned trust. Not only trust is at stake, sincere and loyal cooperation, one of the constitutive principles of the European Union in the treaties. Existing legal channels of cooperation have been circumvented. They haven't been used on purpose. There is the Mutual Legal Assistance, uh, legal assistance Agreement since 2003, and we all know how these indirect malpractices have basically undermined already committed legal obligations. This House and the European Union has clear legal competence on data protection and privacy. And the circumvention or overcoming of existing legal channels, of course, affects the entire EU's common foreign and security policy. And most importantly, and this is perhaps a key message from uh, the study, the internal security of the Union as a whole the internal security of the Union as a whole. The scale and the indiscriminatory nature of mass surveillance jeopardizes the security of the Union as a security of values. Those values that we are all too often mentioning are not just values, are legal principles and they must be uh, respected. It is a theft of data. In the European Union legal system, the individual is the owner of this data. The individual owns data. This perhaps differentiates the European legal system with that of the U.S., but still is one of our core principles. And what we are seeing is that indeed, from the evidence we've gathered, member states have circumvented also this principle very uh, blatantly. Questions of discrimination. From the legal examination we've carried, you can see that in certain member states there is a legal distinction between internal and external interception of communications. Mass surveillance actually makes this, thing, this distinction and the legal guarantees applicable to each of those, internal and external, are no longer suitable. 
we can no longer distinguish so clearly between external and internal. We've seen that through external communications, the interception of external communications in cooperation with the US, the UK has had access of data of nationals, potentially, and also EU citizens. So how do we guarantee that the warrant-based system, which applies to internal communications, to secret interception of internal communications, is still there? when there is this blurring between what is internal and what is external? And how do we ensure that the principle of non-discrimination applicable to any EU citizen also applies there? Very briefly, oversight. The oversight bodies we've seen, perhaps more research is needed there. The oversight, the existing oversight bodies and authorities in the member states under examination faced a lot of constraints and difficulties which perhaps hamper their ability and effectiveness to supply a proper scrutiny of what is going on. Not only questions of independence, but perhaps of staff resources are key and perhaps should be carefully considered. The next slide is about EU Home Affairs agencies. There is a spillover effect into the security activities of EU security agencies. We have a, a body at the European Union level dealing supposedly with intelligence, INSEN. There is no legal basis for this. Where are the legal bases? If the legal bases are so central, perhaps we should also critically examine what are the legal bases of INSEN. And if indeed there is a capacity for the European Union to work on intelligence, why are we so shocked to have more union in this field? Europol, there is now a revision of the, of the, mandate, of the, of the framework, uh, uh, the mandate of Europol. It is absolutely central to ensure that the information that Europol is handling is actually lawful, and that comes from trusted sources. There are, at the moment, no ways to verify that. And this is particularly problematic in respect of third countries. Which kind of information is Europol processing? There is an oversight deficit that we think is uh, absolutely central to address, and also what is police and what is intelligence? Can we so clearly identify and distinguish what is police and what is intelligence when looked at it from the perspective of the professionals working on this issue seem to be very heterogeneous across member states and the points of interception seem to be very unclear. Moving rapidly to the policy recommendations, the study proposed a red line approach. We think it's fundamental to really establish red lines on what uh, should uh, the European Union uh, do. The first recommendation is a professional code and guidelines for uh, transnational management of uh, data. A professional charter is no longer, uh, we argue, um, legitimate to say that the European Union has no legal competence and shouldn't be doing anything on this. Sorry, this is uh, absolutely, uh, uh, we, we think, unacceptable. There should be a code really uh, setting what the standards are in the European legal system, including not only the European Court of Human Rights standards, but also other criteria which would differentiate what is legitimate and what is not legitimate. A European privacy cloud, this idea has been, the European cloud idea has been there for a while. European privacy cloud, uh, the EU needs to develop its own capacities in terms of cloud computing. This may not be an all-encompassing solution, but may give more uh, guarantees and uh, protections, which at the moment do not exist. We need to congratulate the work of this uh, House, the European Parliament, on the data protection um, draft regulation. I think we need to celebrate the, also the, the achievements and the final uh, preliminary output. And it is absolutely crucial that the European Parliament considers provisions such as Article 43 and 79 as red lines in negotiations with Council. These are non-negotiable. An EU policy infrastructure, a common European model for cooperation on intelligence exchange and sharing should be established. We had already proposed several years ago a yellow red card system, transmission of unlawful tainted information in breach of common standards and principles cannot be accepted and should be signaled by a warning a yellow card, if repeated, exclusion from the information sharing network should take, should take place, a red card would be issued. 
A committee at the European Parliament could be established, chaired by the counterterrorism coordinator, to summon actually the way in which EU principles in the field of data protection could be, could be applied to these activities and to move forward with uh, the talks with the US on perhaps a digital bill of rights concerning all data subjects, all data subjects. EU Home Affairs Agencies, the recommendation there, we need to understand the points of intersection with national intelligence and law enforcement authorities in the exchange of information much better much better, the architecture, the information exchange architecture, because it is at those points of interception that more accountability is necessary <clears throat> and more quality checks are uh, of the information being used also are of utmost uh, importance. EU level protection of whistleblowers, of course, these people need to be protected, potentially including a strong guarantees of immunity and asylum. And we welcome also the resolution adopted in October by uh, the European Parliament, calling the Commission to suspend the TFTP agreement. Um, we think that the European Parliament should, all, should, should use all its powers, all its powers at its disposal. Existing agreements and trust-based relations with the US perhaps need to be reconsidered. And uh, clearly, uh, questions of rights and uh, privacy need to become uh, a priority. Of course, this is, um, just to conclude my presentation, this is only preliminary research. And um, we, we call for more research to be done in this subject. We need to know more. And uh, unfortunately, the sources we had, uh, we highlight the kind of sources we've used. But there needs to be more research on um, what is happening, the activities, the kind of uh, checks, if any, uh, that member states uh, are um, conducting. And uh, here, perhaps, social sciences research can help also in political debates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Sergio. I mean, this is uh, preliminary research, but it's uh, in the short space of time we've had to do this inquiry. I mean, this is the second big study we've had in a very tight schedule. And I think colleagues, if they're starting to read this, and they see that the recommendations are here. I mean, they're very, if you don't mind me saying, quite political recommendations, but it's coming from an academic and think tank perspective. They're very useful for us. We're having to make um, recommendations in a report in a very short time period. So this is actually good. It's getting us thinking some, some st substantial um, uh, recommendations here. Uh, I know colleagues will not have had time to read it, but th this is stuff that we, we know. So I'm going to open the floor immediately to the shadows and get a discussion going, which we'll, we've got until 12.15, so there's plenty of time. So just begin, as usual, in our normal procedure with the shadows. That's one shadow. <laughs> We're left with one remain. So Jan, you, you kick off. Um, Thank you. Claude, and uh, thank you to our guests for uh, getting this study done and uh, presenting it uh, in such a very important time as uh, also today there will be uh, the representatives of the GCHQ questioned by the UK Parliament. Uh, I think we are right in time to talk about how we should deal with uh, our own intelligence services in the European Union which obviously came too short in uh, the look of the last week's debates and uh, where there are also obviously breaches uh, to some legal principles. And there's my question. Um, you, I mean, you, you laid, laid down very clearly the recommendations to the European Parliament and what we can do in that uh, situation right now. And um, I appreciate that very much and would say that uh, we really need to have a close look at it and need to debate here how we are starting to, uh, to deal with your recommendations because they shouldn't be just left aside now. And that is my question to um, you on the situation which we have right now, which is an ongoing infringement of uh, citizens' rights, at least... Uh, a high possibility of an ongoing infringement of a vast amount of uh, citizens' rights. And uh, 
there the question comes to myself, what are the possibilities for us as a European Parliament and also for uh, the legislature as a whole to, to stop these infringements in that environment? I read that um, in your study you, you line out, of course, also along the lines of the competence of the European Union, what can be done uh, on the side of police and uh, intelligence cooperation rules. Um, and uh, the, the question is, is that linked to, for example, the Data Protection Directive? Uh, are there points where you see that we should do changes, for example, with regard to these revelations? And also, of course, in the, inter in, in the interinstitutional uh, play here, which is a political, I, I would really like to know how you see our role also vis-a-vis -vis the member states being competent for what we are perhaps not competent for, or how you see we had the uh, director of, of INSEN here, um, how you see uh, the uh, fact that with the cooperation in INSEN, which you also, INSEN, which you also lined <coughs> out, uh, this could perhaps reduce also the scope of uh, exclusiveness of competence uh, on national security at the end. I, I really have some, some question marks here and I really would like to have more elaboration on that also with regard to your study because you should have the time to elaborate on that quite clearly here. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Because we have the time, I'm going to um, take all the country all the contributions. I'm going to take one question and then one answer from everyone. So um, we're not going to take groups of questions. So, and you can answer both or you can take, you know, just nominate one of you. Sergio, do you want to, and please use your academic freedom to be frank, you know. I mean, you're not the head of INSEN, so just go for it. Thank you. I, I very much enjoy, the, you know, enjoy my freedom as, a, as an independent uh, researcher. Um, um, we are, uh, thank you very much for the, uh, the question. I think that um, the, the study proposes a multi-level uh, action, perhaps. Um, there is not, uh, unfortunately, a one uh, simple uh, solution. It uh, needs to be taken from different perspectives and approaches. But I think that the starting point uh, is coming back to the question of uh, trust and sincere cooperation. What does it mean? The fact that we can no longer trust uh, that those principles and safeguards uh, that uh, are in principle sometimes stated by the law are in fact respected in negotiations, not only uh, inside the European Union, but especially in negotiations with the US. Um, exchange of information, processing, information processing goes along, as we know, through different areas of EU law and uh, cooperation, international agreements, not only the TFTP, the PNR, EU-US uh, cooperation on PNR, uh, questions of so-called smart borders, um, where also uh, profiling and use of biometrics uh, are or would be at stake. Um, there are a number of questions, as we mentioned, on EU agencies to be considered. Um, especially the revision of Europol um, in light of these revelations. So it has implications for many different dossiers that the Parliament actually has the competence and is involved in. And uh, the study recommends the, the, this House to make use indeed of all these possibilities to rethink that trust and perhaps, um, you know, start from the premise that there is mistrust. We should mistrust or lack confidence that those principles can, are respected and it cannot be taken uh, for, for granted. Standards, one concrete recommendation. I think that uh, the study um, is very clear in identifying which standards are of more importance. First, clarity and forcibility, criteria and domestic law. This is absolutely central. The law must clearly outline the nature of the offenses that we are looking at. As Francesco mentioned, it's not very clear what the purpose of this surveillance is, uh, the personal scope, the scope of action and discretion, and of course time limitation, judicial um, you know, uh, scrutiny and effective remedies are particularly important when assessing the quality of the law, the quality of domestic law, which the Strasbourg Court has highlighted as a key criteria when uh, determining the legitimacy of secret surveillance by security agencies. 
And I think the study is also very strong in saying that European supervision is still there. The European Court of Human Rights has said in cases such as Liberty versus the UK, Kennedy versus the UK, yes, this is at the core of national interest and it's and the government and intelligence services need to have discretion, a level of discretion. However, that margin of maneuver is still subject to supervision, of course. It has to be, to avoid arbitrariness. There must be a potential supervisory control by a judge, effective control by domestic courts, and most importantly also, um, surveillance of citizens. We highlight that this is not an issue of balancing uh, privacy versus security is a question of democracy and in democracies nationals and citizens are particularly protected against this kind of undiscriminative surveillance and the court has, says, has said in its jurisprudence that this is only tolerated when it is strictly necessary for safeguarding democratic institutions. Is this that the case now? So these standards we think should par be part of a code a code that could be adopted at European Union uh, level and uh, could be also uh, used uh, and promoted at the national level. Um, the question of oversight of national, perhaps just very briefly, uh, oversight of national intelligence uh, authorities, there's been an idea of engaging national parliaments, we're, we're safe, National parliaments, engaging national parliaments through this network um, that the, uh, the parliament uh, coordinates, um, particularly in this area. There was this Brussels declaration. Where, where, where is this? What is the result of that declaration? What has been the output of perhaps making more effective use of the knowledge and expertise of uh, people in national parliaments um, specialized on these questions to share best practices? to share ideas on how to ensure better oversight. And that, that could be a channel for the code to be um, you know, disseminated and uh, communicated and perhaps better uh, implemented. The idea of Vivian Reading of having a, a common EU intelligence agency, would that be a solution? Well, we think no. Clearly to have an EU NSA uh, kind of authority uh, may not be the most appropriate way to uh, uh, handle the, uh, the dilemmas that we are uh, discussing today. However, uh, the study says that it's no longer feasible to say that the EU does not do intelligence, or that intelligence, perhaps, that intelligence uh, is not relevant and is nothing to do with the European Union, where we are seeing how negative the repercussions of what is going on is for the European Union. So uh, this could be perhaps an argument for having more you know, strengthened union action. I suspect some other colleagues may have had those questions as well, but um, the next is Carmen. Gracias, Presidente. Thank you, Chairman. Well, I think you have been quite frank and open in your presentation. I thank you very much for that. Why doesn't Vivian Redding denounce the legal assistance agreement? Because it's not actually working. We here in the European Parliament actually asked for that agreement on the uh, TFIP to be suspended because of what happened. It's time now for the Commission to take initiative. If it would involve a change in treaties and if this is not going to be just a last hurrah before the end of her mandate something s specific needs to happen and it, this is one option she could denounce this particular agreement it could be a first step to demonstrate the differences that do exist in terms of our different views on how the separation of powers needs to take place particularly in terms of how the Parliament interacts here because I think you brought up a subject which is extremely important the ownership of data and I think the data belongs to the individual I've heard theories that go against that saying that the data belongs to others saying once a, an individual has given up 
personal data, it belongs to someone else. But from uh, a legal perspective, I'd like to hear what case law exists to support that argument. I think one of the most important points that you've brought out in your work is this confusion that exists in terms of the way in which public authorities interact with private companies and who plays a role here. Because in fact, judicial scrutiny has to be exercised, it's very important, but we've just approved a directive on data protection which gives a huge uh, room for manoeuvre to member states. It doesn't really actually demand legal scrutiny in any way. Let's hope that some kind of code of conduct comes forward, but the Charter is very different. It's different if someone is suspected of a crime to the situation where someone is just having their data hoovered up as part of a systematic routine procedure, where governments can decide later on whether that's going to be useful from an industrial espionage point of view. But I think it's different where this kind of data can lead to someone going to jail. So that's why I think European constitutions have to be respected, but it seems that that's not actually happening. In my country, you have to have a legal permit in order to bug phones, but really what we're seeing here really flies in the face of what's written and enshrined in European constitutions. I think this is a huge change of paradigm, what we're seeing here. So I think we need to distinguish very clearly between what is used for public, by public authorities and what data is used by companies because as we've seen here, the NSA have managed to get access to that corporate data uh, for the use of the NSA. And as I've said, this really puts us in a post-Snowden environment where we need to look at things carefully. Karen, you your reaction, Sergio. Uh, thank you very much. One of the elements that the study highlights in one of the um, aspects of uh, oversight of intelligence is that they say the activities of intelligence services are by nature unlawful. They are supposed to be working outside the law. And we challenge that argument. Through our investigation, it's clear that the European human rights uh, framework does not agree with that argument. And um, one of the problematic aspects of the kind of mass surveillance that uh, we are witnessing is that it is about, was mentioned before, it seems to be about <coughs> ways of life of people. It seems to be about profiling, linking that with data mining, and predictive behavioral issues. And these are indeed very tricky questions from a data protection law point of view, which must uh, be debated and, uh, and, and solved. I mean, in the U.S., there have been discussions on banning certain kind of data mining activities, uh, some of which have been unsuccessful. We call that in the study. Um, focus has been given that interference to data should be only, or data collection should only be applicable to individuals under investigation individuals under investigation. This could, uh, I think, is something that uh, you know, is, is important to, uh, to highlight. Ownership of data, I think that the data protection regulation um, has been adopted by this House uh, is very strong from this point of view and is to be welcomed. Um, similar regime and similar framework should also apply to law enforcement of, uh, activities, absolutely. And, um, yes, absolutely, please. Thank you. Um, 
we can get another round in if, we, if we're going to keep things brief. So, um, Next is Mrs. Morvai. Thank you. I would like to speak Hungarian, so please put your headphones on. At around the time of 89, the years of transition, we had uh, a visitor at the university visiting from uh, the West. And this visitor said the following. Communism is a system that's very much like a ballet performance. Everybody's watching what's going on on the stage, uh, but everybody knows that this is only a performance. It's all make-believe. Apparently, the same holds true for Western democracies. We then used to think that there was another world out there, uh, beyond uh, the Iron Curtain, uh, checks and balances, democracy, human rights, rule of law, um, all of those things are granted in the West. And it seems it's all been a show, nothing but a belayed performance. Same uh, here and in the United States. In, f from a committee of uh, 120 uh, members, uh, only seven or eight of us were present in the morning when such an important issue was being discussed. This undermines our whole concept of uh, democracy. Maybe the presence sheet will uh, include a different number, and just like at 9 o'clock, uh, now uh, at 10 past or 15 past uh, 11, there are only eight members of the European Parliament. Where is Mr. Tavares now? Uh, I think it's unfair and unjust that um, uh, Mr. Tavares is not fighting for democracy in all the other 26 member states. He only is, he's only worried about democracy and the rule of law in Hungary for some strange reason. Maybe your recommendations could include um, the need to look into, to take a closer look at uh, the values, ideology uh, of uh, the European Union and uh, Western Europe and how that's different from uh, communism, where we had the Stasi, we had the Securitata, uh, we, we all knew what was going on, we were all being watched. If you're here as an observer, uh, assistant, uh, or whatever, well, maybe it looks different on camera, on screen, but there are only eight members of the European Parliament present. Let me uh, point that out once again for all of those who are listening and watching. So, behind the Iron Curtain, uh, in communist countries, everybody was uh, being watched. And, and it was... Uh, part and parcel of the system that there was ongoing mass surveillance of uh, citizens. We still demand uh, the lists of agents to be published in Hungary. It's still not public. And we are still trying to come to terms with our past and try to uncover the truth um, and find the, the guilty uh, members uh, uh, from the communist past, and here people in the West uh, just say, well, it's natural that everybody's being watched, uh, everybody's uh, emails are being read. Mass surveillance is uh, natural. Is it? Is it really so natural that uh, my colleagues don't even bother to show up? Uh, they're not interested, uh, they're not surprised at uh, the in-camera meeting, uh, our uh, guest said that he was not surprised to see that this was all going on. Hopefully I'm not going to be sent to Guantanamo Bay for leaking that information here. <clears throat> Shouldn't we dig deeper? Why uh, isn't Snowden offered uh, refuge. Uh, refuge in any of the member states? Maybe Hungary should uh, offer refuge uh, to Snowden because he has proved to us that this is only a show, it's only one giant ballet performance. He has uh, un finally uh, uncovered the truth that the king is naked. We are all uh, in the academic world uh, thinking about uh, what democracy really is. Maybe you as academicians should suggest to the European Union to rethink our concept of democracy and how it works and how it should work. Thank you.
point of order from Mr. Albright. Ja, sehr geehrter Herr Vorsitzender. Chairman, I have to speak plainly. Uh, speaking this way of colleagues when they're not here is completely inappropriate. I think we need to have a serious uh, discussion of the matter, but uh, populistic uh, attempts uh, to blame individual members uh, for something that uh, relates uh, to uh, the majority of member states' uh, position on uh, fundamental rights. I think this is uh, something that ha doesn't have anything to do with um, the way uh, fundamental rights are breached, not only in one member state, but generally in the EU. We can't change that uh, in this way, but I think uh, this is identifying a situation uh, that uh, deserves um, a general discussion, but this is not the place. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't want to get. I take that point of order. I don't want to get into a discussion, but I think naming individual members who are not here is not uh, fair. But I think. Uh, um, I know, but I, Mrs. Morrow, I think you made your point, um, and the counterpoint has been made, and the member in question is not here, so I think that point has been made. Well, I think I don't want to get into a long discussion about it. I think both points have been made adequately, and the member in question is not here, so it's unfair to enter into a discussion. So let's move on. Um, so the next uh, next question is from Joseph Eidenholzer, and, and your points will be answered after this. Yeah. Ich, uh, thank you, Shin. Ich. Thank you very much. Well, I think it's a good thing for us to be paying more attention to these matters, for us to be discussing them here. I'd like to thank the speakers for the quality of the study that's been put together, particularly if you think about the time constraints that were in play. I think it does give us a lot of room for thought on this matter. I always get the feeling that we find ourselves at a historic juncture it's not just about the scale of this scandal, it's really something that speaks to more fundamental issues, freedom of citizens, freedom of consumers. And I think we are really at an epoch-changing time, and we here in this institution need to discuss this intensively. One thing that worries me is the way in which the public and private spheres are being mixed. It's true that the public authorities have used private companies. It's unclear as to whether they've been coerced, whether they've been forced into cooperation, or whether they've entered into that cooperation voluntarily. A second aspect, which is problematic, is whether or not that f free cooperation or voluntary cooperation is something that's being remunerated. In the world of digital communications, it's very unclear and it's difficult to get to the bottom of this. We're not really sure which data is surplus to requirements for these large corporations and which data ends up being surplus and then sent on. I'm not really clear exactly whether or not these companies are processing data, whether that collection uh, takes place from intelligence services in a different way. I would very much like to have more information about that. I'm very intensively involved uh, with this. But are the businesses involved actually processing the data? Are they using that data to try to provide targeted advertising, for example, trying to provide specific advertising information to specific individuals? Or is this a kind of symmetric data transfer process? Because it seems to me that that symmetric processing of data no longer exists 
I'm not just being affected as a citizen by this, but also as a consumer. So it's not just my citizens' rights that are being affected, but also economic and competition rights, potentially, that could be affected by this. So this is something of a philosophical discourse now, but I think there are lots of questions in this field, and that's why what we're doing here is so important. And, of course, as you've mentioned, it's about internal security of the union as a whole. Really, that's the core of the issue. Now, what we're dealing with now has actually dealt, uh, created un uncertainty and insecurity. And if this kind of activity creates insecurity, then it's actually having... Uh, the perverse effect to what it was intended to have. So I'd be very interested to hear more about that aspect of cooperation, whether it's voluntary or not. Thank you. Um, thank you. This may be an appropriate time for me to ask my question. Mr. Engstrom is next. I don't know if, he, if you have to go now. or may it, it just seems appropriate to ask um, uh, my question because Mr. Weidenholzer started to go into the commercial aspects and you touched very briefly on um, safe harbour. You didn't go into detail and I agree uh, with what Joseph said that this is a really helpful study and you, you did indicate, Sergio indicated that this is an initial study done in a very short time scale. We gave you a very short space of time to do it. But um, I wanted to ask this very important question about safe harbour which, which um, we, we dealt with in one of our hearings and we got a very stinging testimony um, uh, really taking it apart um, and obviously within the prison program all the companies involved Google, Facebook and so on were well, alleged to be involved um, you know were um, signed up to Safe Harbour uh, I mean, basically what, what is your view on this I mean do you think it can be a reformed Safe Harbour too or I mean just tell us what you think um, could be salvaged because you just touch on it but you don't go into great depth and can you just um, talk about the wider point following on from what Joseph is saying about the um, you know basically back doors into um, internet providers and what this is doing um, to the commercial environment when we were in Washington last week um, we went to the Federal Trade Commission but we also spoke to individual companies and there's this breakdown of trust you talk about the breakdown of trust between um, US and EU, but there's a, there's, there, there is the huge issue of commercial breakdown of trust. And again, in a study of this size, you're making recommendations, but you, you can't really get to, the, to this huge issue of um, commercial breakdown, which is affecting uh, commercial relationships. And it's just interesting, you can be frank, and use academic uh, freedom to really talk about this and give us some perspective on what's happening. So it would be useful to know that. And then, I don't know if you, if you want to answer that, and then I'll take Mr. Engstrom after, after that. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think these are very uh, important questions uh, uh, that you are asking, and I, I'll be happy to talk to some of these points, and also to talk to what is the extent of knowledge we have at the moment, and, and what is it that we still need to know. Uh, one thing we know for sure is that, uh, and this has been discussed in many uh, business circles and te you know, technology circles, is that data is basically the new gold. Uh, data is the new, uh, the new oil uh, for the next century to come. Uh, and so uh, one fundamental principle uh, that uh, all the companies that basically uh, use data as uh, the main, uh, the main uh, element of their business model, such as Google, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, but many other companies uh, that are much more obscure, that process data at a mass uh, scale for just questions of uh, insurance, banking, and so forth, um, uh, these all are essentially uh, business models that are based on trust. Uh, they are based on the trust that the consumers or the trust that the business entail to particular service providers to uh, safeguard their data and to keep their data. Now, what these revelations have done uh, is to fundamentally erode uh, the trust that the consumer can have uh, um, in relation to how um, his or her data is uh, processed by these companies because of uh, the nature of the relations that might exist uh, with agencies such as the NSA, but not only uh, with um, uh, 
uh, GCHQ and other intelligence services uh, uh, in Europe. So I would say that yes, uh, and this is something that we emphasize in the studies, is individual freedoms uh, are at stake, consumer rights are at stake, but also if we look at the question from the uh, part of the companies, uh, um, economic viability of these companies is at stake. And um, uh, it might not be the most important point in the discussion, but I think it's also worth um, uh, mentioning that the recent uh, uh, declarations of the CEO of Google in this regard have been particularly telling. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, the NSA has not only forced legally to uh, 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 companies such as Google to provide them with uh, data at request, but that they have also coercively uh, tapped uh, the data between data centers uh, uh, of Google, uh, of data that was not encrypted because it was considered to be, uh, to be uh, safe. Uh, and this has not only happened in the United States, but also in Europe. Uh, so at this stage, we are speaking about data transfers between different uh, uh, data centers of Google inside uh, the European Union, which has been tapped by the NSA. And so, the, of course, the reaction of uh, the Google CEO was that of outrage because heavy economic interests are at stake. Um, now, to come back a little bit to the question of the relation between uh, companies and, uh, and uh, uh, intelligence services, um, you raise very important questions, uh, unfortunately, for which we don't have uh, many answers uh, at the moment, and uh, this definitely requires more uh, research. Uh, what we know is that the PRISM program, for example, of the uh, NSA, but I think it's important to remind uh, uh, the audience that the PRISM program is data that is, uh, uh, the data collected through the PRISM program is available to GCHQ uh, within the context of the UK-USA agreement and the context of, uh, sort of also called as uh, the Five Eyes Agreement. It's also available to other countries such as Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, so this data directly concerns a, a security agency in the European Union and the very recent revelations have also shown that the data available uh, uh, to the GCHQ through the PRISM pro program might also be available to other intelligence uh, services in the European Union. Well, this data is directly, uh, date might potentially and is uh, to a certain extent a data of citizens of the European Union. Uh, so precisely the type of surveillance that uh, intelligence uh, uh, services, external intelligence services in the European Union are not uh, supposed to be doing is actually taking place. Uh, through uh, these hybrid partnerships of security services and private companies. Now, to the question, uh, I would just speak briefly to two, uh, to two points, to the question of whether these are, uh, companies are willingly collaborating or are they being coerced. So far, we have evidence that they have been coerced uh, by legal means. Uh, we don't know how many of these companies have proactively uh, offered their participation, but um, there has also been a lot of uh, companies who have decided to resist uh, this type of, uh, well, lots, maybe it's an exaggeration, but uh, companies such as Lovabit um, or Silent Circle, uh, Lovabit was, uh, for example, a company that uh, offered uh, encrypted email services uh, uh, and um, in which apparently Edward Snowden also had his, has his email address and this company was uh, uh, served in order to, uh, uh, to provide the information and has decided instead to close uh, and now the, the owner of this company might face, uh, face a judicial action from the side uh, in the United States because he um, uh, uh, refused to collaborate uh, in these agreements. So there's a heavy cost to pay not to collaborate with that, uh, these uh, provisions. Um, and uh, uh, yes, maybe I'll stop uh, here and I'll let uh, Sergio uh, discuss the question of e USC or Harbour. Well, did you mind maybe I would take Mr. Engstrom? He's been waiting patiently and then we can take maybe both of you. Mr. Engstrom, do you want to give your question and then we we'll take both of you? Um. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Ragazzi, uh, I was, I was very, very interested when, when, when you talked about, about the well, the usefulness of, of this mass surveillance, if you want. If I understand you correctly, you said that the NSA initially claimed that they had some 54 cases, but then it's been, they've had to scale it down to, to one or two foiled terrorist plots. Now, I mean, as we all know, uh, preparing to commit a terrorist crime is a very serious crime in itself, uh, uh, very often considered almost as serious as actually carrying it out. So... Uh, 
Yeah, uh, okay, extraordinary renditions were mentioned, but, but, uh, but otherwise, if, if they find a real terrorist uh, plot uh, and are able to stop it, I, I would expect uh, convictions in, in, in ordinary courts. These one or two cases, have they, have, have they led to, to convictions uh, in the U.S.? And uh, as a second part of the question, in Sweden, uh, the Swedish government is making similar claims, saying that the FRA surveillance has led to well, lo lots of bad things being averted, but, but they ha haven't uh, really given, given any specifics at all. And they have certainly not pointed at any Swedish court case. Are you aware of any Swedish court case where, where this mass surveillance has led to some criminals being caught? So over to both of you. Yes, uh Thank you very much for the question. Uh, I don't think that the NSA has disclosed which cases in particular uh, have been the ones who have fallen, so I don't think we have the information uh, on that, but I might be wrong. Uh, and um, I'm not aware uh, of Swedish court cases, uh, but there might be as well. So unfortunately, this is information I don't have. Uh, it's true that in the course of a deeper study, this is precisely the type of information that we'll be looking for. Perhaps very briefly, coming back to the point that you um, raised before on the US-EU uh, um, uh, safe harbor agreement, uh, clearly uh, the case illustrates how uh, this agreement has been uh, gravely uh, violated. And uh, we need, need to reflect on uh, ways to address the challenges of cloud computing and how cloud computing, we addressed that in a previous study um, by DG Eiple, which provided very specific uh, ideas and recommendations on how to address this uh, uh, challenges and questions of adequacy, uh, testing the adequacy, um, and bringing a rule of law framework to their uh, legality framework are absolutely central. I'm just going to take um, Mr. Corona now, but when you uh, answer the future questions, could you also maybe, if you've got any knowledge of EU telecom providers, we, you know, we're always talking about the other providers, but not the major you know, established landline, if you like, the big providers. We invited B BT and I think France <laughs> Telecom, the big ones, and they're not. We invited them. Uh, we invited them. We invited them all, and they're not um, responding. I don't know if you you did that in the study. I've not managed to get through all of it yet, but um, just maybe comment on that if you if you've had a look. But um, Mr. Corona, do you do you want to ask your question? Well, not really. I'd just like to congratulate you on the study that you've done. It's very interesting. I'd like to ask a question, although I'm sure the answer is already in the report. Some time ago, the ex-Chancellor of Germany, uh, Mr. Schroeder, said on this subject, I've never had any illusions that my telephone calls were not uh, overheard. He took it for granted then that it would be impossible to prevent uh, phone tapping, as you've also said. My question then is the following. What suggestion would you give the European Parliament in terms of how to find a strategy or a law that can act ahead of time. Given that we take for granted that we're not going to be able to prevent uh, surveillance, what laws can be used to deter agencies from using this information, either commercial or other information? Furthermore, I fully agree that we need to change our conception of trust. Based on your experience, over recent years, and given that we have uh, trusted that the, the fight against terrorism was a priority, well, we actually gave too much trust is that what your study has shown? Did it show that we have uh, trusted far too much 
in terms of uh, what the governments and intelligence agencies have been asking? Um, so I'll, I'll first uh, uh, answer maybe this question and then come back to the question of uh, telecom providers. Um, thank you very much for, for this question. I think this is a, an important question that many, uh, also private citizens, are asking themselves, how can I protect my data? Um, I, I think there are several technical ways uh, of doing this at the individual level. Um, I think, for example, it has been shown that the Tor network is a good way to uh, uh, protect your data from uh, types of... Uh, <clears throat> of spying and that it actually has been one of the uh, ways in which uh, uh, one of the sort of technologies that exist that the NSA has not been able to systematically uh, break. I think also open uh, source encryption uh, software is available and it has also been shown that this is probably something that the NSA has not been able to uh, to, uh, to um, uh, break, uh, although they have spent considerable amounts of uh, money uh, in trying to um, put uh, different kind of backdoors uh, uh, into private encryption systems. Um, so recently I read the blog of a Google developer who said that he had basically been working for two years or, or three years on, in, on an, a particular encryption method to safeguard uh, the uh, Gmail, uh, the address, the, the privacy of Gmail uh, users and that this is exactly what had been destroyed by the NSA. Um, so the short answer is at the individual level there are open source uh, uh, software solutions that exist that can help you uh, assure a certain type of privacy. I think at the more structural level, uh, one of the recommendations that the report does is the development of a European privacy cloud, uh, which would ensure maybe not a full uh, uh, um, uh, privacy, but at least would uh, uh, be a step towards uh, uh, more protection uh, in terms of the private data of citizens. And this would include, um, I think, possible techniques such as uh, source uh, uh, pa packet uh, routing, which means that uh, the type of data that you store in a cloud or that you send to somebody else in the uh, EU doesn't necessarily pass through uh, uh, the US or to other um, <coughs> other types of network and there are other, also other technical solutions that we provide uh, in the report. Uh, and now just to quickly answer uh, also maybe from a, a technological part and, and, and my colleague will answer more on the legal aspects. Um, the recent NSA whistleblower, uh, I mean uh, NSA whistleblower Will, William Beeney uh, has recently um, uh, explain that basically in 2000 there was a type of technology that he uh, and some of his colleagues had developed to do more or less uh, 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 similar things as to what is done now in terms of uh, surveillance and the ability to track uh, online traces of individuals online without massive storage of data. So without uh, um, the type of mass surveillance that we are seeing now. So in a way it was a type of program a security program uh, which embedded forms of privacy by design. Um, and in the NSA, this was a program that was discarded, uh, and in his declarations he argues that it was because of economic reasons, that basically uh, having a huge... Uh, a program that would store millions and millions of data would require huge budgets and this is what the NSA needed at the time. So I think um, without even necessarily arguing that we should not trust um, uh, the intelligence community when it says that uh, uh, the fight against uh, terrorism is one of the priorities, it certainly is. However, I think the question of the proportionality and the purpose of the data that's being collected is, is, is essential uh, to keep in check uh, this type of uh, um, uh, of developments because the technologies have been shown to exist uh, to um, basically have the same purposes without all the unnecessary uh, uh, collection of uh, private citizens' data. I think we're going to take a final question from Brigitte Sippel. Oh, and then a supplementary. It's never ending. Yeah, Brigitte. vielen Dank. Um, Thank you. I wish to return to the matter of uh, the 
extension of data collection, which is quite significant. I don't know if this has been covered in your previous research, but what I'd like to know is uh, whether the extent of surveillance uh, has uh, clearly increased uh, since the 9-11 attacks, if there's a link. And secondly, whether that link still exists if it does exist at all, and um, are uh, the threats uh, truly increasing? We've gathered from the NSA that their financial portfolio has risen uh, recently dramatically. Is the Has the world uh, become so much more dangerous, or uh, has life in the U.S. become so much more secure uh, because of this um, technical potential? Uh, that would make the equation make more sense. I'd uh, very much uh, uh, appreciate uh, your work. Also, uh, as regards giving Europe a competence to deal with uh, cooperation uh, between agencies, and um, uh, wor if we have to wonder uh, what point our work has if uh, any of the agencies uh, don't um, respect uh, uh, the laws we frame. Uh, we know that uh, not everyone respects uh, all the laws uh, that we adopt 100 percent, but still there's a point in uh, having them. And so we appreciate uh, your red lines as regards uh, the work of the intelligence agencies, but the question is not just uh, it's not just about drawing a red line uh, as regards uh, the technical means, uh, but also the uh, objectives, why uh, the information is being uh, collected, but who's monitoring all of it is uh, the next question. Uh, when we're talking about uh, national uh, security, uh, whether it should be in the hands of the remain in the hands of the member state, or whether it's uh, to be an EU competence, um, we really do need to know whether the red lines are going to be uh, respected. Data uh, protection has been raised. I wonder whether the whether rather than a bilateral anti-espionage uh, agreement uh, between member states, uh, which uh, it's not really possible anyway. I wonder whether it wouldn't be better to invest in what you were uh, talking about. That is not just uh, data protection agreements and agreements about uh, intelligence. Um, investing in security systems against um, uh, surveillance and interception, I think that would make more sense. Uh, when you're talking about uh, particularly sensitive data and servers and also uh, when it comes to securing uh, citizens' data. Thanks, Pradeep, for that. I'm just going to take um, this final point from Jan Albright, then I'll ask both of you to make a final comment and answer uh, Brigitte's substantial point and then Jan's point. Thank you. Just uh, two follow-ups, one directly referring to what Ms. Sippel has said, because I really ask myself if you have any indication if uh, those debated no-spy uh, agreements will anyhow have an impact on programs like PRISM or Tempora uh, and on the mass surveillance on which we are talking in this inquiry. Uh, that's the, f the first follow-up. The second is we are talking also about uh, cyber attacks um, from, for example, the GCHQ on the information systems, like you said, of uh, U.S. companies having service here in Europe, but also, for example, uh, very likely on the Belgium telecommunications company Belgacom and their systems uh, and system providers. So when it's about cyber crime legislation, my question to you would be also, in how far you see uh, breaches to existing cybercrime legisla legislation or possible infringements in member states on EU level and in the cybercrime convention of the Council of Europe. And um, when it comes to our own systems as European Parliament, I mean, we are using Cisco uh, systems phones, everybody of us. Um, and quite obviously, uh, there is a high risk of them being compromised. So would there be a possibility for us as institution 
go to court against possible infringements of uh, those uh, uh, systems, of our rights, of uh, uh, also perhaps um, an infringement to the treaties. I don't know. It's, it's just an interesting question at the end. Thank you. It's nice that you characterized your own question as interesting. I thought it was interesting as well. Um, modesty. Um, and you saw our Belgacom um, inquiry. It was um, pretty hard hitting, we, I felt. So um, I don't know if it, I, I haven't got through this, so I didn't see whether you cited it. But, but two very interesting, uh, substantial questions to finish with. And any concluding remarks you want to make? Both of you. Uh, thank you very much. So I, I really see uh, three points here, uh, um, so I'll, I'll try to answer them in, in the order. Uh, well, the first question about the telecommunications, uh, I think we, we now have evidence that the telecommunication companies have been uh, targeted by GCHQ and, and possibly by other uh, intelligence services uh, in, in, the, in, in Europe, but I think it's important to know that as soon as one of the intelligence services targets a company, then it's very likely that it might eventually share the information with other intelligence companies, so it becomes a European problem. Uh, so I think this is uh, true for Belgacom and it's true for other companies, uh, uh, both in, uh, in Germany and the UK. Uh, now, uh, I think the question about the technical uh, forms of resisting, and again, I think I, I, I need to emphasize I'm not a, a technician, but the, uh, the, the solution that we see uh, when we discuss with experts is essentially the one of open source software. Uh, open source software is not just an idealist uh, type of a form of developing software in which uh, uh, developers work on a voluntary basis, but the, the one principle which guarantees uh, uh, that forms of snooping and spying and putting back doors within software uh, is, is not happening is that the code is available for everyone to see. So every possible software developer can scrutinize the code and look for possible uh, uh, backdoors uh, uh, within uh, the, the software. And so I think uh, this should be definitely uh, the type of software that should be encouraged uh, by the European Union, that should be developed more by the European Union, and, and possibly that could, uh, to answer your very precise question, maybe one, uh, be maybe one of the solutions uh, also for the communications problems here in the Parliament. And now uh, to come back to, uh, to your question uh, uh, about uh, the question of uh, uh, information uh, threats and, and the development of mass surveillance, well, it is true uh, that in the United States the uh, events, although they were already uh, in the plans, it's, it's true that the events of 9-11 uh, gave a green card uh, for the budgets to explode uh, in terms of uh, mass surveillance. Now what we know about Europe is that many of the intelligence services in Europe have not immediately started doing these type of activities uh, straight after 9-11, uh, uh, but have uh, more or less caught up in the last three to five years. Uh, and the very recent revelations have shown that the GCHQ in particular has played a pivotal role in providing assistance to other intelligence services, uh, uh, not only in technical means, but also uh, providing or offering to provide uh, ways of circum circumventing legal disposition in order to, uh, uh, to uh, increase the, the, um, uh, the surveillance. And I think here, uh, maybe more at a sociological level, uh, in particular the work of Didier Bigot, uh, who has, uh, who's one of the authors of this study, shows that um, the collection of mass amounts of information is one of uh, the uh, cards, or if you want, is one of the uh, justifications for intelligence services to sit at the same table and to cooperate. Uh, and so one of the drivers for the collection of mass amounts of information is also to be able to exchange this information uh, between other services. And therefore what we see is essentially a competition to, the, to more and more uh, data collection in order to be considered equal and important partners, and of course the collateral damage here is the privacy of uh, European citizens. Um, so I'll leave it to that and I'll, I'll give the floor to, to Sergio for the more legal aspects. Yes, very briefly. Um, I think that uh, one of the elements which have come up uh, out of the discussions is that indeed we are talking about uh, unions' values, fundamental rights, democracy and rule of law, 
We, do, we did have um, a Commissioner Vice President uh, Reading alluding to the UK in that context of Article um, 7 on the Treaty on European Union. Uh, we are witnessing a systematic breach of uh, fundamental rights uh, in certain member states. And the question, uh, it is a very uh, difficult one from a legal point of view, uh, because we do have a fragmented, a largely fragmented um, legal setting in respect of uh, the issues we are talking about. And we've seen in the study how sometimes perhaps this have, may have served the interests uh, of uh, intelligence communities to uh, do shopping, foreign shopping, not just on privacy, but also other legislations which apply. And um, this is an issue of, should be an issue of uh, concern. Concerning our previous question as well, I think, uh, and the study also argues for, a permanent establishment of a policy, policy infrastructure in the European Parliament that could be capable of ensuring a follow-up of all these revelations. The inquiry committee is most uh, welcome, but perhaps we, uh, it will be necessary to have a more sustainable um, oversight and accountability of uh, not only what we know now, but we will be knowing eventually in the months uh, to come. And uh, this infrastructure could also, um, you know, discuss and develop um, modalities of action. And what are the issues? It has been mentioned the role of oversight authorities, not only supervisory authorities, data protection authorities at the national level, uh, the role of data processors and um, uh, controllers in cloud computing uh, services uh, could be a, a central issue as well. Which kind of information are we talking about? What is the data? Uh, perhaps also more legal certainty there uh, would be uh, welcomed. And law enforcement authorities, who are those intelligence communities? This was also another aspect uh, raised by the study. Um, it is not very clear. There is a blurring of uh, these uh, actors. And uh, we jeopardize, of course, the, the, the degree of um, accountability that uh, they are subject to. And then another recommendation that has been put forward in previous uh, studies we've done for the European Parliament is a permanent, perhaps, committee on EU home affairs agencies, um, particularly but not only uh, addressing the uh, oversight issues of Europol and other um, actors which are working uh, at European Union level are ready on questions related to these matters. And here also the Parliament could have a very important role. Thank you, Thank you very much. Many of us um, know of your uh, work with CEPs, your GHA work with CEPs, and many of us, of course, here have worked with you. So this is particularly helpful that you both, both of you have produced this um, in, a, in a very tight time scale. And, it, and it, I mean, on first reading, it goes with the grain with what many of us are, are formalizing in terms of, you know, what we have to put together for, for our report. So it's a very useful contribution for us, and I think it was a very useful session to help us formulate some of these ideas. So thank you very much for that um, session. And... Uh, um, to say to colleagues, um, the next session will begin at 12.15. I won't be chairing. One of our vice chairs, I think, is going to rescue me. Um, so I want to particularly thank those members who are regularly attending and also to, to experienced members who are um, coming in for the first time to thank you for also attending. I mean, we're holding these sessions now because we have to on a Thursday and Thursday afternoon, which is not the easiest time, but this is the only time we can do it. So I want to particularly thank members for their attendance and for the uh, excellent questions that they're putting. This has really been helpful. So thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, um, sorry, one, one other announcement. There is a vote at 12.15, which... Um, I don't think I'm taking it. I think a, a vice president is coming to rescue me for the vote, I think. Otherwise, I'm going to take the vote as well. I'm, I can, I'm available for anything else you want me to do. I'm going to take the vote as well. <laughs>